Hi, this is Mark Fletcher, and welcome to my world. Before 1970, retail in the rural South was much like it had been for a hundred years. The general store concept still applied. In our small town, we actually had two Ben Franklin stores. They were called five and dime stores. We had one on the upside of our red light in our downtown and one on the downside of our red light in our downtown. If you wanted groceries, the Milan supermarket was just around the corner. It wasn't much bigger, but the people there knew your name. Some say they still wish it was still like that. But like I say, it's a southern thing. Sit back and enjoy. Southern Tales, Episode 2 of Season 2, Blue Light Specials. This is going to be a fun one. So, our town got some of the larger food-type stores around 1970. Places like Big John's and Sunflower, which everybody called Sunblower because of the cursive writing. It kind of looked like that. Uh, but like I say, it was Big John's and Sunflower. They started to build and... Not long after that, a happening that would change everything, our town got a magic mart. Change was coming to West Tennessee, like it or not. And while there may be some disputes about the actual facts, this is the way that I remember it. And in my opinion, every goddamn word is true. My dad used to go to York's Barbershop every Saturday. No kidding. Every Saturday. It, it was like a big deal. Saturday morning, we would take that seven-mile ride to the big town, or whatever they called it back in those days. I'm sure I thought Milan was a big town, just like Humboldt and Henderson and Selmer and all the other little puddle jumps around West Tennessee. But... It seemed big to me. We would go to York's Barbershop, which was not too far from the Milan Supermarket, just off the main center of town. Harold York, who had kind of this big, huge pompadou hairdo himself and big, long sideburns, he would charge Pop two bucks, uh, mostly because Pop took up chair time. But Pop was bald, except for a little bit of hair that surrounded his shiny head like a life preserver. About once a month, I would get into that chair, and he charged Pop $3 for me because the hair was over my ears. Barely, and they kept it that way. I had a mandated crew cut through the third grade, and I liked it. I won the seventh grade beauty review for being cute. But during third grade, I started to notice many kids were letting their hair grow long. In the lunchroom, I remember the cool kids had Beatles Yellow Submarines lunchboxes. Of course, I had a red and black paisley kind of lunchbox that I think my mom picked out for me. But I wonder what the yellow submarine lunchboxes would be worth now. Hmm. 
I, I digress. I, but one of the cool things about third grade was that our teacher, or my homeroom teacher, Mrs. Pruitt, would read to us during rest period. Wonder whatever happened to rest periods. And, and for a while, she read a book called Jack Tales. It was a book that compiled the legendary stories of a Lappin, uh, Appalachian Mountain hero named Jack. Every chapter was wonderful and funny and even educational, though I didn't realize it. I read that book to my kids when they were in the 9 to 11 age group, and I hope they read it to theirs. You can find it on the Internet. Worth a read if you're one of those old-fashioned people who still like to read. Um, back, back to my story. As you can tell, going to town was a big deal. Occasionally, we would eat out. My dad called every eating place in Milan a greasy spoon. I was instructed to only order what I would eat and then eat every damn bite. I would get the fried egg sandwich at Southgate for 50 cents, and sometimes he would let me get a second, as long as I ate every damn bite. And, and we would go to the grocery store to do the dealing, as Pop called it. They had teenagers and even older men who worked as baggers. They were professionals and always take your groceries to the car. I mean, the same was true at the gas station. You would not get out of the car. The guy would check the oil and whatever, wash the windshield. It was just part of the deal. And, and you could trust this guy. He wasn't trying to sell you stuff like they do with the oil change thing these days when everything in your car needs replacing. Your local guy down at the Fina station or at the Pure station or Skelly or whatever it may be, he was some good old boy who told you the truth. I remember when self-service came to our town. Pop thought it was a communist plot. Truth is, it might have been. But then the day came when Magic Mart opened in our town. It truly was magical. It was clean and big inside, lots of wide aisles and tons of merchandise. You could have packed both Ben Franklins in that store ten times. It was just a feeling of wonderment inside. I mean, it, it was just out of this world to some kid from the sticks. And, and listen, I might not have the, the order quite right, but around the same time, Old Hickory Mall in Jackson was opening. It was the first of its kind anywhere, as, far as I knew, certainly in my world, when, when I was a kid, Jackson seemed like such a, a metropolis. I remember my, one of my goals in life was, man, I want to grow up and live in Jackson. Old Hickory Mall was first opened as an open-air mall. Sears was in the front and Penny's in the back, as I remember it, with a bunch of smaller stores in between and a movie theater and a Baskin-Robbins in the front. Talk about wonderment. I just never had any idea that the world was such a big place. I mean... I'm from Lavinia, Tennessee. People in West Tennessee didn't even know where Lavinia, Tennessee was. So to me, I guess every place looked large, but the mall was cool. They had a big fountain and benches and, and did I mention ice cream? Yeah. From my standpoint, the coolest place was the Swiss Colony. Remember those? Yep. They had free samples of beef logs and Little hard candies that had names like Whiskey Sour and Tom Collins. When you could convince Pop to buy some of those, you were guaranteed to be the coolest kid at K.D. McKellar Elementary School the next week. One time, Tony Ossemacher and I kept going around the circle eating samples until the manager had to ask us to leave. Oh, we did, but we, we'd, gotten, we'd gotten our fill for sure. Of course, it wasn't long after that that Jackson was a birthplace of fast food. In my world, Jackson was the birthplace of everything. Culture, indeed. They had they had two theaters downtown and plus a theater at the mall. I mean, that's big time, right? But fast food did come to Jackson. I, I don't think fast food came to Milan until Sonic, probably around 75 or 76. But Jackson had fast food way sooner. I, I remember that my parents would go into Arthur Treacher's Fish and Chips, and I would walk next door to McDonald's. Again, it was just cool and bright and sunshiny with cartoon characters and happy meals and milkshakes, and it was always packed. Pop used to tell me that they could build a McDonald's in the middle of the desert, and it would be packed. 
Sometime later, we took a vacation in Denver and actually saw a McDonald's in the middle of a Kansas wheat field. You guessed it. It was packed. Now, not long after Magic Mart came Walmart to our town. Now, Walmart was just as big, but in comparison, it was a junky store. I mean, it had narrow aisles. There was crap piled all over the place and tables out in the middle. And I mean, it was clearly not as classy as Magic Mart. But as you know, there was a method to their madness. I mean, they didn't waste a lot of money on aesthetics. You know what I mean? I, I still sing their theme song from those days. It went something like this. Shop the Walmart for savings you can see everywhere you look. I'm convinced that they got a bargain on their theme song because it didn't even rhyme. I mean, those guys were always looking for an edge, those Walmart folks. And, but, but once again, you know, Walmart was a fantasy world because it was just so big. You could wander around and, and be amazed. Uh, I, I always thought we had everything until Walmart came to town. And then uh, I felt like uh, we had a ways to go. I mean, I'd see things I never dreamed we'd see in our little town, things that you could see only on catalogs or on those fantasy television shows or fantasy shows like Fantasy Island with Ricardo Montalban. But anyway, I I did. I I felt like I I suddenly realized that we might be poor, you know. (laughs) Um, and, And I can't remember if it was before or after Walmart, but Kmart came to Jackson and it was even more of an event and more exciting because that's they made it like that you know they, they added excitement to Kmart so whatever Walmart was at the beginning or Magic Mart Kmart added a little bit more and and in Jackson I think it was one of the first things built on the bypass the 45 bypass you remember the Keith Short bypass the one that nobody ever knew who Keith Short was they still call it the Key Short Bypass. It's been there 50 years, and I still don't know who Key Short is. But Kmart was at the intersection of Old Hickory Boulevard and the 45 Bypass. Uh, I think there was a Ramada Inn that they were building there at that point, and maybe Hamilton Hill Shopping Center was starting to go up across the street. And, of course, the Village Inn Pizza Parlor, which was the place to hang out in Jackson if you wanted to act like you were cool. But... but Kmart, before all that, was the coolest of the cool. And on Friday nights, you know, Pop and I would go. I think that my mother went, but I I don't know that I ever saw her because uh, I was just happy to do something with Pop. But Kmart was an action-oriented place, right? And they made it special because they had these temporary sales, kind of like Black Friday now. And these sales would only last 15 or 20 minutes. And it was kind of crazy, and it was hard to fight the crowds, and there were people, like, pushing and shoving, and, and you, there was only a limited amount of whatever it is they were trying to get rid of. So it wasn't long before it was sold out, and usually for 15 minutes was more than enough. Um, af- after a few visits, I remember Pop decided that just me and him would start going to Kmart for the Friday night event. And they called these blue light specials because they had a little cart on wheels with a blue light atop a 10-foot pole that flashed like a police car. And even just me and Pop, we fought the crowds until Pop got an idea. And trust me, my father was an idea man, if there ever was. I'm not saying all the ideas are great ideas, but anyway, um, his idea was for me, little kid, right, to shadow the guy pushing the blue light because it'd only be like every hour, sometimes every 30 minutes, and people would drift away. But my job was to stay right with this guy and be ready. And as soon as he got to a location and the lights started blinking, I was supposed to rush up and fill our cart with as many bargains as I could grab. It didn't even matter what the bargain. These folks were pushing and shoving and striving to get as many products as they possibly could. And all the bargains that we'd ever gotten were stuff we needed. We just might not have needed 20 of them at that point. But this thing was like Black Friday with the crowds and everything. And it's where rudeness was first invented to uh, big box stores, I think. Um, But we became pretty damn good at it. 
I mean, I would even call it efficient. Pop and I had a really good run, getting as many bargains as anyone and more than most. He was so proud of me. I began to think that I might be as cool as my older brothers or older sister, at least for a minute, because I was Pop's partner in the bargain chase. Until one dreadful night. I was having a good night. Really fruitful, right? I was chasing the blue light, and I was good at it by now. Pop didn't even have to mess with me. He trusted me to get the max for the minimum. This way, he could look at car parts or engine additives or new and improved fly swatters or whatever he was into while he trusted me to chase the blue light. At the end of a couple of hours, he would search me out, and we would head to the checkout. We were in line, and I always had a cart stacked full with all my bounty. And as stuff was going on to the checker's uh, belt, he started looking at what was being put on the belt. And he was seeing all the great deals I had gotten. And then some candles passed by, and these boxes passed by, and the ladies started checking them out. And it turns out, I had 42 boxes of Summer's Eve Midnight Spring flavor. Heck, I didn't even know what it was. I thought it had something to do with candles or something. How would I know? The package was very deceptive to a 12-year-old, or maybe I was 11. I can tell you for sure. I, You know, it was really bad. Now, Pop, being who he was, felt he was obliged to pay for it. I still didn't know what it was, but he told me when we got into the car, that was the last time I was in charge of Blue Light Friday. I never saw those packages again. For the liner notes of this episode and all episodes of the Southern Tales podcast, please go to broadneckmusic.com. Here you'll find out more about the episode and perhaps more depth. You'll also find out more about our kick-ass theme music this, this season from Audra Brown, one of Memphis's best young songwriters, guitarist. You can also see our contact email address, which is stalespodcast at gmail.com. You can ask us questions or comments, whatever. Hey, and you can also relate your stories, and we will eventually have an episode with your stories. If you get enough questions, we'll have a question-answer episode. Once again, thanks for listening, and please tell a friend about the fun we're having on Southern Tales Podcast. 20 minutes and a smile. See you next week.